What's going on, everyone? Taylor Cowles here for CLNS Media, coming at you with another episode of Pats Daily, brought to you by our good friends at Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of CLNS Media, but more from them later. If you uh, follow me on Twitter, you know why we're like a couple minutes late. I have been <laughs> defending Keon Coleman with my life. I'm honestly, I'm not like crazy sold on the guy, but like, I don't know, man. Some of the Nikhil Harry talk's been crazy. If you want us to talk about it, put it in the chat and maybe That's I'll use it. Address. Uh, but we have a mailbag today, and I haven't had my good buddy Mike Cadillac on in a hot minute, so we needed to have a reunion, answer your guys' as, as always fantastic questions. But before we get to that, Mike, how you been, buddy? I missed I'm you. good. I know. It's been too long. Uh, glad to be back on the uh, this side of the aisle with CLNS. I'm watching you and you know Brian and Barth do all your stuff, and glad to be on this side of it. Let's roll. Let's answer the questions, because it's, uh, it's a fun time. I, I feel like this sort of lull between uh combine into free engine into the draft is just a bunch of what ifs so uh it's this is the fun time to ask and ask and answer the the crazy questions from fans so let's uh let's get after it thanks for having me yeah we might have to do another uh three-man uh mailbag soon yeah the three-man weave yeah miss miss the whole gang being together but yeah all right let's see what do we got at the top of the chat or at the top of the mailbag my bad. I am so like literally rattled. I was in I was in fight or flight mode for so long. All right, let's shake it off. I have a question. What the hell are the Pats doing, and why can't they close on? I don't know anyone. You want to go with this one first? Yeah. I feel like you've been answering this question a decent amount. I've been answering it a lot. I've been talking about it. I've been writing about it, and I get like, look, look. Put it this way: Elliot Wolf and Gerard Mayo did sort of back themselves into a corner with weaponize and with burn some cash, right? Because they made it seem like this was going to be turn it around Super Bowl contenders next season. We're going to empty the bank. We're going to get freaking Baker Mayfield and Kirk Cousins, and we're going to let them compete. And then we're going to have Calvin Ridley and Tyron Smith and Trent. Like it just, I don't think it was ever really going to be that way. I think when the seatbelts came off, when Bill left and everything was okay and everyone was talking to the media and we're fun and all this stuff, like, and I get that you want to reset, but I think the way they came across early made fans more excited than what this really is going to be, which is a longer term rebuild, right? You're coming off a four and 13 season. You don't have a franchise quarterback. You have a first year head coach. You have a new coaching staff. You have a new front office like this. Everything's not going to click at once. And so, yes, it's disappointing that they miss on Calvin Ridley. I get that from a fan perspective. I get it from a media perspective. You want to be able to cover top tier free agents like guys like that. Right. But at the end of the day, they made some of the right moves internally. You know, all of their internal moves were the right moves. You bring on one who back, you bring Bourne back, you bring Henry back. Um, and you re you reset with the good guys from that team and you cut bait with the Parkers and the Mac Joneses of the world who were the bad guys. on, Or not the bad guys, but the bad player. You, you get what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. right. So, so stuff like that. And so is there more to come? Of course there is. Do they have to kick ass in the draft? Yeah, now they kind of do, and that's the tough part. You got to hit on tackle and receiver still. But uh, what the hell are they doing to answer the question is they're slowly going to rebuild this team from the ground up, and you just have to trust this Packer way, Elliot Wolf, Gerard Mayo process. And uh, it's going to take time. It was always going to take time. So we're still in the very early stages. And uh, look, I get it. It's, it's easy to come at this team right now, but I think they're in an okay position uh, to, you know, to move forward and ultimately rebuild this thing. And let's think about it. So Gerard Mayo, one, we know he's a jokey guy. He just made the mistake of like literally his first day on the job speaking to everybody made yeah, right. a really big statement. I understand that. To be fair, they've been spending money. They're just spending it internally. They're yeah. using it on their guys that they wanted to retain, which was the most important part and is what free agency is all about. If you can make a splash signing, fantastic. But every single year, we see teams spend all this money, and then we look back on it a couple months into the season, and it was like, what the hell was that yeah, about? Right. Like, none of these guys are panning out because you get guys that don't actually fit your system. Or people are like, oh, get a Marquee, uh, a Hollywood Brown, you know, get um, Gabe. Nobody said get Gabe Davis. I just can't think of any other names. Right. But, like, you do need people who fit your system. Get talent for sure. But when you have a team that's full of Zs and slots, you need somebody who's either a really good Z where it's like, all right, we'll condense the formation and we'll make it work or you get an X type. And there just weren't many of those guys available. Now I will say 
the Calvin Ridley thing was disappointing. But one, mm -hmm. they made an effort. That was the one player that it was reported they were actually in on and tried to pay. Then he goes right. and gets a four-year, $90 million deal. And this is a team that's going to draft probably two receivers, maybe multiple pass catchers. So giving Calvin Ridley a four-year deal just doesn't make sense when he's 20. I don't care if he thinks he's 25 years old. He's 29 years old. <laughs> he, he, yeah, kind of, 100%. Yeah, right. There's a little bit less tread on the tires with, you know, you know, he sat out for a while in the gambling suspension, but he is still, like you said, he's 29 years old. Like, don't get it to us. Exactly. And then on top of that, like 20 million, 21 million, I'm like, all right, sure. I think he like average, like, was it 23 million a year or something like that? Like, yeah. At some point, you got to put your foot down. And I think you, and they got close. Like players. you said, they, they were close. up there. And, the, look, I remember when Jacoby Myers during Super Bowl week was talking about how the Patriots were just a million dollars off in the negotiations and everyone was pissed that they didn't just, you know, they were too cheap because they didn't go the next million. But in the situation for Ridley, it sounded like he wanted to stay down south. It sounded like he wanted to stay in Jacksonville. Tennessee gave the godfather offer of all the money. If the Patriots won up Tennessee, who knows if Tennessee doesn't one up them again. And, one, and then at that point, you're going to 25, 26. And it's like, that's not what Calvin Ridley's worth. I'm sorry. He got a ton of money in Tennessee. God bless him. Good for him. If the Patriots signed with that, I wonder what the conversations would be right now and if everyone would be saying they gave him way too much money instead of they didn't, you know, shell out the cash and sign them. So locally, I'm sure people would have bought themselves into it. But I think nationally, we're seeing that people yeah. are like, no, the Patriots are doing pretty well. Like I had Brad Spielberger on yesterday. He gave them a B plus. And that's because they didn't spend money in bad places. Right. And then if they had signed really to a $20 million a year, we already know that they're probably, or at least it was reported by Mike Reese, they're talking to Christian Barmore, starting right. contract extension talks. Yeah, they have $50 million, but if they had signed Ridley and then you extend Barmore, that money goes away real goes away real quick. Right. So I think we need to keep perspective. The one guy that I really was like, mm, why weren't they on in on him was Jonah Williams. Mm -hmm. And even that, I kind of understand because what did he get for um what kind of deal did he get? Do you remember how many years? Got, is it two years for 30? Yeah, honestly, okay. I I would have liked him to be in on that, but we Me don't too. know how I feel about Chooks or for. I think, like, statistically, by looking yeah. at the film, he's a better pass blocker because he's more athletic. His hand technique is really good. He's not as well-rounded. That's my biggest thing. But he's been a starter in this league for multiple seasons. only reason he wasn't last season was because he insulted a coach that got uh, fired two weeks after right. he got benched for talking crap about him. So, you know, again, we got to keep these things in perspective. When Ellie Wool said weaponize, we kind of conflated that with the burn some cash. He said they were going to weaponize. He did not say it was necessarily going to be through free agency. Right. And again, I, I think they made the effort. They tried to get Calvin Ridley. But other than him and Dalton Schultz, we talked about it. It's like, who else did you want? I there know. Was a, was the receiver fit. market got so inflated with uh, – not really inflated, per se, per se, but like the franchise tags with Higgins and Pittman, and then mm -hmm. Evans goes back. Ridley becomes the guy. He bubbles up to the top of the market. And he's not really worth that top of the market money. So at that point, it's hard to judge. And, you know, guys like Tyler Boyd is still out there and Hollywood gets his deal in Kansas City. But like the receiver market wasn't great in the first place. Right. Right. Because you got or, outside White, of the franchise guy. It wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. But like, yeah, once those guys started flying off the market, it's like, all right, there just aren't any good options. Like, don't just throw money at a player to throw money at a player. That's bad. Exactly. Business. So, right. I think we're on the I would have been in on the tackles. I would have been in on the tackles. Even Tyron Smith. Like, I would have maybe yeah. give that a shot. But yeah. I know. Right. So this is where we're at, unfortunately. And so his base salary. It's like $6 million on a one-year yeah. deal. He's yeah. basically trying to retire with the ring. That's what that deal tells you. You think he right. was signing with New England in a rebuild year his last season in the NFL? They were they were going to have to outbid that like a lot. Uh, they would have yeah. had to you know significantly outbid the Jets on that. So it wasn't even, really happening anyway. Right. I got so much crap for saying, oh, he went to a place he can get a ring. Everyone's hyping up the Jets last season. And I understand Aaron Rodgers had a serious injury. But right. Kirk Cousins had a serious injury too. Their pocket passes. He, he just got four yeah, years, 180 million. It's insane. And the Jets didn't lose anybody significant. It's like Bryce right. Huff is the one big player they lost. And they completely retooled the offensive line with two players from the Ravens who were just in the AFC Championship game. Right. So, like, right. you know, let's keep that into perspective. Whew, mm -hmm. I'm still hot and bothered. This is fun. <laughs> oh, I missed you, man. All right, next. <laughs> what do we got? More likely a wide receiver at 34 or an offensive tackle at 34. Oh, I might be able boy. to slip my Keon Coleman agenda in here. <laughs> I'll let you go first then. All right. Um, okay, here's my thing. Unless someone falls who they think can be a day one starter, because there's enough depth on like in the second, third round, like Patrick Paul might be a third round guy. Javon Foster is a guy who's really talented, but also raw. You could probably get on day three. For those reasons, I think you go with the receiver because 
I think that's where you like if AD Mitchell falls, I love him. I don't think he's going to. If they say if you're get is there in the second round, you get him. Those are, I think, the best fits if you want the guys who fit the kind of Packers Browns profile where they've got good size and they've got vertical speed and they can also make things happen with the ball in their hands. And they're those X types that you really need. Right. Because most guys in that range, and this is why I've been backing Keon Coleman, I understand not loving him as a prospect. I totally get that. But when you look at the guys who are vertical threats, like if they get Jaden Daniels, he's a guy who gets makes most of his money throwing vertically on slot fades or go balls. Right. Troy Franklin is kind of that guy, but he's they're not taking uh, Troy yeah. Franklin. Like that's you're doing Taekwon Thornton again. He's better after the catch, but in terms of that undersized speedster, it's a little repetitive. Keon Coleman, I think you could debate whether he's a real second round prospect. Some people think he's a first. I could understand people thinking he's a third or a fourth. But he's a guy who can win vertically. And be, even though he's not fast, he can go above the rim and he's got great ball skills and he's got great size. So for those reasons, I think you got to go get your guy, like your true X, or at least mm -hmm. your first go piece where he's not a full-time X, but you put him there in certain matchups and he can move around the formation. Get that guy in the second round because I don't think there's a lot after that. Like I think uh, Javon Baker is mm -hmm. probably the only guy that you may be able to get later in the draft who gives you real vertical ability and some production after the catch and has good size. But, uh, yeah, I think you got to go receiver because I feel like the guys who fit what they need right now are going to dry up. Like Latin yeah, McConaughey, yeah. Ricky Pearsall, Roman Wilson, good prospects, really good prospects. If they take Drake May, I might be more open to it because they mm -hmm. can win on those crossing routes. But I also think they've got those Z slot types already. You got Kendrick Bourne. You got K.J. Osborne. You got Demario Douglas. And then you got guys later on that you can get who fill a similar role. So, yeah, I, I really just think that you got to go with a weapon at 34 because there's not a lot of guys with the same ceiling as you go later in the draft. So I'm still not sold on them not making like a trade for a wide receiver, right? Like, I, I don't know. And that's not informed. That's just speculation. And that is just thinking that this team needs that number one wide receiver and they need a number one tackle and they haven't addressed either one yet. And when you go into free agency, you're not going to get your number one wide receiver there because teams either uh, draft and extend those guys or they trade them away. Like you need to get it through a trade or you need to draft them. And so, yeah, they could draft one at 34, but I'm don't like, don't sleep on T Higgins coming here. Don't sleep on guys like Brandon IU coming here. I'm sorry. Like that kind of stuff can happen. Like they could trade for T Higgins and would it take number 34? Maybe. Or would it take a future first or a future second? Maybe. And we'll see what happens. But I just – I don't want to sell that out yet, and I think that looking at the tackle class versus looking at the depth of the wide receiver class, I know they're both very deep, but I think they may – you know, with the signing of Osborne, with the re-signing of Kendrick Bourne, with the emergence of buff Tyquan Thornton, as much as I hate to say it and as much as you love to talk about it, I wonder – Buy stock, yeah. <laughs> buy buy Taekwon stock, according to Taylor. I'm I'm not sold yet, but again, we'll see. Couple shares. I I think they yeah. I think they might be. I might I think they might feel okay with their wide receiver room right now. Not okay. I think they're gonna have to add to it. But point being, they don't have a left tackle right now. Like yeah, you mentioned Okora for, but he's played right tackle. He's played like what three snaps at left tackle, and yes, he could make the transition. But yes, on the college, you played left tackle. That's the thing. So yeah. there is the translatable. Like I understand it's a different point level. being. Yeah, but he's got a lot of experience there. It's not like some. It's two sure. years. Point point being. On the depth chart, they don't have a left tackle right now. Maybe Connor McDermott's under contract. I forget. But, like, that's yeah. kind of – yeah. It's and so they need it. They need a left tackle. They don't have one. I wouldn't be surprised if, depending on who falls, if they went left tackle at 34 and then waited on the depth of the receiver for pick 68. So, um, more likely, I'm going to say left tackle. I think they I think they take a tackle at 34. I don't dislike it. Like, I like Kingsley Suomatea. I like Kieran yeah, Omega yeah. G. But it's like they're not going to start year one, most likely. I know. That's the I mean, problem. The receiver is going to start year one. The right. tackle is probably going to have to wait a year. So I'm thinking, okay, talk about value year one where, like, you do need somebody who's going to contribute right away, you know, especially next year. You can take a tackle next year if you're so bad you have, like, another top 10, top 15 pick. Right. It's just that, like, those day one starting left tackles, I think Troy Faltani is going to be the last one off the board. He's probably going to be out of there in the top 20. So, yeah. you know, it's tough. All right. Is there any chance the Patriots would consider moving strange to left tackle if there aren't any options they like in free agency and prioritize receiver over tackle in the draft? I think he's I hope got, not. <laughs> he's still learning how to play guard, honestly. Like, poor guy. I mean, poor guy. You know, that may sound a little corny, but realistically, like, he had a rough start to his rookie season. 
then he gets better towards the end of the year. I think like half of his games in his last like eight games, he didn't allow a sack or a pressure, didn't allow a single pressure. Then this year, the knee injury in training camp misses almost the entire summer, puts him way behind after dude like put on weight to take on power. He couldn't get chemistry down with his guys. He his technique fell behind. He finally gets in there. He's in and out because he's still hurt, gets mm -hmm. healthy. Even Belichick is like, yeah, Cole's playing really good football. PFF said he was playing really good football. The eye test tells you he was playing really good football. Mm -hmm. And then he gets hurt again. So, yeah. honestly, I think he's just fighting for where he is right he's now. He's fighting for his football life right now. <laughs> like, yeah. let's call it what it is. Yeah. Seriously. I'm not moving and him to left tackle. I'm sorry. Right. Keep him at left guard. Let him stick in there. That's where he's comfortable when he's healthy. You can keep the – your line is set right now, I'd say, outside of left tackle. Like, Mike's yeah. going to play right tackle. You have Andrews at center, obviously. Uh, Strange at left guard. And then I was fine with City at right guard. Like City so played good left guard, uh, right yeah, guard I, I last year. I think he's locked in. He's got. So him. do he's I. And really so well. don't start messing with the left side and put Strange out there and have to rely on Mafi. Like like that's not that's not a good recipe. I'm sorry. I I don't want to mess with putting him at left tackle. He's he's still like you said. He's still trying to hone in the guard position. Let's let that happen because when he's healthy, he's pretty dang good at it. So. No, thank you. And City even told me at the end of the year, he's like, yeah, I thought I did pretty well considering I spent the entire summer at tackle. Yeah. Like, yeah, but dude, it's kind of a similar thing to Strange where he spent the whole summer kind of behind because he got right. thrown into the fire week one against the freaking Eagles. It was the first time he played guard, like, basically all summer. So, yeah, I agree. I think, uh, yeah. Like, I had yeah. Strange. I, I I came out with a piece uh, this morning where I graded all the players on offense. And some people were like, why is Cole Strange a quality starting potential? Because mm -hmm. he, he, we've seen it. Like, yeah. he plays good football when he's healthy and when he's got his feet under him but i mean he's got to prove that he can stay on the field catch up and then be a reliable piece for them. the but scale for strange is so weighed because he was picked at 29 and yeah. that's not his fault is he worth the 29 like a, like a borderline first second round and it was the end of the first round like i really feel like that gets hyped up too much and at the end of the day, was he worth the 29th pick with what the Patriots had and needed? Probably not. Like, did they reach? Yes. It wasn't a smart pick, but he's still a good football player. And like the Sean McVay, Les Snead video where they're laughing that the Patriots took him. The other side of that is they wanted to get him and probably take him earlier than they did. And they're like, oh, crap, you went that early. Damn it. Like, you know we what didn't I mean? Have to take him with. That's exactly. what they he might have yeah. lied a little bit, but either way, they were like, yeah, no, we just like literally couldn't have taken it if we wanted to. So, <laughs> yeah. So Cole Strange is, he's gotten screwed by injuries and he also got screwed that he got picked earlier than he probably should have because he, he can be a good football player in this league. Yeah. Center, once David Andrews retires, I'll entertain the idea. But, uh, and even that is still tough because it's like very different mechanically. But yeah, keep Cole Strange where he is. Let him try and yeah. get it down to left guard. Yeah. Do you see the Pats spending big next year if the quarterback they pick looks legit? I mean, they're going to have a lot of cap space. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is when you do it. That yeah. is why I'm if, okay with – If there's players worth spending. Yes, of on. course. Of course. But – We yes. need that caveat, if, apparently. <laughs> yeah, seriously. But no, like, okay, 100 plus million this year. They've spent mm -hmm. around half of it, I think, is the number right now. Miguel has them at around 50 million left, right? And like you said, they are spending money. And I think they're eighth in money spent and they went into it second. So, like, yeah, they're, they've held back a little bit, but – it's because of reasons like this. It's because why are you going to waste it now when you're going to bring in this, not waste it, but you're going to bring in this rookie quarterback and who knows if he's going to be that good. But yes, if they come in the rookie, whether it's Daniels or May and have a season like CJ Stroud did in Houston last year, then they're going to do what Houston did this year and spend a ton of money and bring in guys on defense and offense and expedite this process and try and take, get a hold of this rookie contract and try and win a Super Bowl. So hundred percent. If if the if the rookie quarterback plays well, they're gonna. I see them spending big next year. Honestly, and like even right now, they're kind of following that Texans blueprint in terms of like how the roster's built. Are they as explosive yeah. as the Texans? No, they're not. But like Robert Woods and Kendrick Bourne, pretty similar in terms of guys coming off injuries. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Robert Woods is a couple years off his injury, but still like older player, captain type player. of guy. Yeah, right. Tank Dale, Demario Douglas. You can draw comparisons there where they're undersized, but they're electric playmakers downfield and underneath. Yeah. Noah Brown, like he's more he can play that X role, but he's a guy where he makes his living on crossers. What does KJ Osborne make his money? Yeah, on? crossing routes. Like, I mean, Dalton Schultz is obviously better than uh Hunter Henry, but you can see where a lot of it's very similar. And the offensive line is a bit more of a question mark because of strange and the whole left side of the offensive sure. line, but they're making strides to at least 
get to a point where they can, um, you know, protect their quarterback. And we'll see what happens in the draft. All right. We got more of your lovely questions to answer. But first, quick word from our friends at FanDuel. Nope. Prize, Prize picks. picks. <laughs> We're back. Football season may be over, but the action on the floor is heating up. Whether it's tournament season or the fight for playoff home court, there's no shortage of high stakes basketball moments this time of year. Get in on the excitement with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. Want to play alongside some of Prize Picks' favorite players like Meek Mill and Sugar Sean O'Malley? You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries from some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community each week. Prize Picks even offers injury insurance so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and doesn't return in the second, that player projection won't count against you and the rest of your entry stays live. With Jason Tatum going for the MVP, I'm taking more on his points and rebounds. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. That's code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, what do we got? What do we got? What do we got? <laughs> Perfect. What do you think is more likely we stay at 34 in terms of wide receiver position, Leggett or Coleman? You want to go first before I start popping off? Yeah, I think that um, – who do you think is more likely if we stay at 34? I think Leggett's going to turn into a first-round pick. I don't think Keon Coleman is. Oh, so I, know, I think I Coleman's more likely to be there at 34, and I think that that's what they would ultimately do. Um, if that's how the board fell and if their eyes were on receiver. Because Coleman, like you said, prototypical X, something they need in the in the offense. And Leggett's draft stock sort of went like this a little bit at the beginning postseason, and now he's just on an upward trajectory once again. Um, and I think, again, receivers are going to go. Guys like A.D. Mitchell are going to continue to creep up the board. Guys are going to go. There's going to be a run on receivers at some point late, and I think Leggett ends up going in round one. So long story short, Coleman's going to be there at 34. So go ahead on your key, – uh, excuse me. Go ahead on your key on Coleman rant because I know you've been waiting on this one all day. Yeah, first of all, Xavier Leggett, like run it up to the uh, draft – yeah, the human who puts draft things in. I don't yeah. know. I always forget what it's called. But no, I think he's fantastic. But um, I, I actually just finally got to watch the bootleg podcast episode for their offensive gems. I'm not going to do it as much justice in terms of their breakdown of Xavier Leggett. But he's had so much work against him. Like people say, only only had one season of production. This dude has overcome so much. He, you can hear, he's a really intelligent guy. Uh, well spoken clearly like a very good and like dedicated person in terms of the fact that he stayed where he was at in college despite the fact that like he could have gone elsewhere was very talented if you just watch the tape you can see like oh no this dude's legit he gets some criticism for his route running but he's a good route runner he snaps routes off well he doesn't let guys stay on his body he gets into blind spots like you can see all the tools are there he's just not like freaking julian edelman where he's not gonna like sit in a chair every time and get really low yeah, he can right. separation um, so Xavier Leggett, like, I don't think it's close between those two. I think they're very different tiers of players. But here's my thing with Coleman. He gets in the kill Harry Tops. And I understand why Patriots fans would think that kind of, you know, because the kill Harry just traumatized like a whole generation of Pats fans. But realistically, he's not the same player. He's Nikhil Harry was slow. Like I, I was, I was like, maybe I need to watch him. Like before I posted anything about Keon, I was like, let me watch Nikhil just to make sure. I'm not misremembering watching him. He's even slower than I remember. Like yep. truly he's like plodding out there. It looks like he's in mud. Keon, if you look at them side by side, they are not the same. Is Keon Coleman fast? No, but he mm -hmm. is not slow. He's got the size and the jump ball ability, all that. Where Nikhil didn't succeed was the fact that not only was he not a good route runner, but other than the jump ball stuff, he wasn't the yak threat people thought he was going to be. And with Keon, it's different because, like, they did have the thing where he did the gauntlet and he was faster than Troy Franklin. Like, his game speed is legit. If you give him an alley, he's taking off, and he's also big enough that he can, you know, make guys miss. I don't think he's super elusive. Like, honestly, in the tape I watched, there's only a couple really impressive yak plays, so I'm not going to act like that's his whole game. Mm -hmm. But my thing is, if you get Drake May, then sure, get, like, a Lad McConkey or someone more in that vein where they can win kind of intermediate and they can win deep if they're schemed open. If it's Jaden Daniels, I think you need a legitimate vertical winner. And I don't think there's a lot of those guys, again, like we mentioned, who fit the Patriots profile. I also think as a route runner, Keon Coleman's completely different. 
He threatens vertically a lot better where you can see that corners are trying to keep up with him downfield. Even though he's not fast, he snaps routes off well. He's got better feet. He's more deceptive and does a better job attacking blind spots. Like they're really, I think that there are things that are similar, but I think they're very different players. And I think that the fact that Coleman can succeed underneath and vertical, and I think, especially once he gets into an NFL coaching system where he learns how to kind of cut down with his footwork and be more efficient, I think he can be a better separated against credit. Also, I was kind of excited about the idea of maybe Jordan Travis in the fifth round. Mm -hmm. I'm off. Honestly, I'm off. There were so many passes where Keon Coleman is wide open and it's behind him or it's just completely uncatchable. Like the dude's jumping and the ball's like over his head. He's six foot four. Yeah. So like don't just look at the contested catch numbers because that's why it's important to watch the film. A contested catch is not always a metric of how much uh, separation someone's getting. It often is, but it, especially in college with accuracy being streaky, a guy can have separation, the ball's behind him, and because he has to catch it behind him, the, res- the corner had time to get back into the window and contest it. So I- I'm not saying that Coleman's like some generational prospect. Like, I'm not saying that. If you right. think he's a third or fourth round prospect, like, I'm not really even going to debate you. Just everywhere that I've seen, scouting reports, Bleacher Report, Draft Network, all these places that I really respect and the people I respect are saying he's going to go in the first or second round. So that's why I have him projected there if, like, you want a vertical threat for uh, Jaden Daniels. But if it's like if you do get a Drake May, then no. I'm like, all right, yeah, don't take the chance yeah. on Keanu Coleman. I just think with Jaden Daniels, you need someone who can win vertically in a straight line. And that's just what I think Keanu Coleman does better than the rest. How did I do? You said it best. That was great. I'm with you. I'm I'm with you all for it. I know. Seriously, take a sip. Uh, pick 34 is prime prime real estate for him, though. I I, I agree. I, that's why. I mean, I said it too. I said it in less words, but I think Leggett's going in the first round. I think Coleman's there at 34. And you're right. Uh, he would pair well with a guy like Jaden Daniels if you end up taking him at number three. If he goes to the Bills, I'm going to do something to myself that I'm not allowed to say on camera. <laughs> I'm going to be pissed. I'm going to yeah. be very angry if I have to watch Xavier Leggett on another team twice a year. Just say that. All right. Can Alex Austin or Marco Wilson be the legit option at boundary corner? Mike Austin smarts and Wilson looked big on the field the little he played at the end of the season. You are very perceptive, the puff puffy. Um, I'll I'll kind of kick this one off. Um, yeah. I, I think they could definitely still add at the position. Mm-hmm. Like, I think they have a lot of bodies, but a lot of those guys are unproven. Even Marco Wilson, I think he's been like an okay NFL corner. I don't think he's been great, but Mike Pellegrino does such a great job with these guys that, you know, they don't really have to invest premium assets. Christian Gonzalez was obviously an outlier because he's an elite talent. You could still argue that was a bad pick considering what they needed. Um, But yeah, I really like Alex Austin. Didn't have a lot of tape that scared you. Like for a young guy, especially who was drafted when he was, who'd already been at two teams before he got to the Pats in his first season. You're thinking, is this guy getting burned? Like, is he not like very competitive? What's good? The interception against Josh Allen, I saw it and I was like, there's no way he baited him with this. Because he completely I didn't it. Did. <laughs> yeah, it was nuts. It looked, like he did. it looked like he bit and then recovered. I remember I tweeted, yeah. I was like, oh, no, it was just a really athletic play. He said afterwards, no, I knew it was coming. I'm like, yeah. well, hot damn. Yep. Look at you, young man. So I, I think he's got a pretty bright future. And any, everything he gave up was like he was playing too far off. And I think once you gain more confidence, I think that's kind of thing where you don't really need to do that and have as much cushion. And when the coaching staff has confidence in you. So I'm really excited to see Isaiah Bolden and Alex Sauce and kind of duke it out on the outside. Um, and then Marco Wilson, it's such a small sample size, but yeah. it's another body. And it's a guy who has experience who I think is better than just throwing a bunch of young guys, especially considering how many uh, guys they have who are either consistently injured or coming off significant injuries. Um, yeah. So can they be sure? I'm not going to invest in them and say, yes, they will. Although I did say Alex Austin had quality starter upside mm-hmm. because of what we got to see in a limited sample size. Um, but yeah, I, I still think like if they wanted to add Steph, have him come back, right. I think that's a great move to add some more insurance and then those guys can learn behind him. Um, but yeah, I really like Alex Austin and would like to see more from Wilson. Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to pencil either of these guys in as their day one boundary cornerback starter just yet. I, I mean, I think you can, they can, or especially Alex Austin again, can, can work there, um, but I don't think having these guys on the roster, like you mentioned before, should stop you from adding to the position by any means. Sure. I think if you can go get a free agent, I think if you can take one, you know, with your third round pick in the draft and start Austin to start the season, and then kind of develop somebody else to start, you know, opposite Christian Gonzalez. That way, too, like if if this is the way they go and they don't trust Austin on the outside, then you got to go back to the whole move John Jones outside, and then you got to move. Uh, Marcus Jones inside. And then there's the whole ripple effect where if you can 
either trust Austin or you can grab a boundary corner in the draft who ends up being a starter. Then you can put Jones on the inside where he's more comfortable. And then you don't have to rely on Marcus Jones as your slot guy. Who's like, I know you're a um, Marcus Jones believer and so am I. I think he's solid. Um, he's in the field. Hut. I need him to stay on the field. You got to stay on the field, and he's better off being a rotational guy who you can also use as your partner turn and your gadget guy. Where he, when he's playing all those snaps, it's again you're not going to stay on the field for that long. So, long story short, I like Austin. I like Wilson. It's good that they're two guys you added mid season who actually showed something. Where we're talking about them now, and we're not just kicking them to the curb. They're actually legit players. So, um, promising young guys, but I don't want to necessarily have to rely on them as you know day one starters for this team next season. Yeah, agreed. All right. If the Patriots were to trade back with the Vikings and obtain two to three first round picks, do they do you think they'd have a shot at a top two tackle at the 11th pick? Yeah. One, I will say, I know Albert Breer reported that the Patriots probably aren't going to move. Yeah, there's which like, they really like. Third pick. Yeah. yeah. Or even the commanders aren't going to move. So it looks like uh, Drake May or Jaden Daniels are going to be the guy. Hypothetically speaking, I keep doing these mock drafts, and sometimes Olu Fashanu falls, sometimes he doesn't. I don't mm-hmm. think he's going to fall because usually Talise Fuanga, who I think also I would not be surprised if he went before um Olu. Yeah, me either. At all. Um, especially like there's good defensive defensive players in the top ten, so you know somebody could slip. I think it's possible. The thing is, if Talise falls, then it's like all right. That's, he's a right tackle, though. I know. You already have a right tackle. Right. So, you know, he is a really good tackle. Obviously, you're saying top two. But I just – I would be surprised if Olu fell out of the top ten. Not shocked uh, because there are so many good players. And I know right. there, you know, maybe some critiques because he's kind of younger. He's less developed than, like, a Joe Alt. Although his physical upside, I believe, is higher. Um, but, yeah, I I think it's not a great chance. But, you know, it's possible. I, I think – I think Fashanu could fall, and nothing against him, but yeah. if, again, Minnesota trades up, right? So they're going for a quarterback. So that adds J.J. McCarthy to the top 10, and then um, the receivers are going to probably go. Like Adunze, Neighbors, and Marvin Harrison, I think are all going to go in the top 10. Like they're Those three are legit, obviously, players, and so is uh, Fashanu. So it's not nothing against him, but I do think that they have. there's a legit chance that Fashanu goes. Because then, too, if McCarthy goes – who knows Just if a team – who, know, who knows if a team goes, you know what, got to take Penix now, got to take Bo Nix now. Like, I know it's early, <laughs> but who knows, right? Like, that's just how the draft goes sometimes. If McCarthy – Justin goes, Herbert gets traded, then – yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And so, you, you just never know. And so, I do think there's a chance that uh, they would be able to trade back from three and end up landing for Shano at uh, 11. And I know that there are reports out there, and I get it, and I trust Burt, and I know that he uh, – he obviously understands what goes around in league circles, but you know, there's still six weeks left. And if the Patriots continue on their uh, evaluations of these guys and they don't necessarily have the conviction, maybe they once did, they could still, you know, answer the phone and end up trading back. And I wouldn't necessarily say no, if they offered 11, 22 or 11, 23 in a first round pick next year, you have a lot of holes and you got to fill them. So we'll see what happens. But yeah, I, I think there's a chance that Fashanu falls. Fill your holes. All right. Now, <laughs> there's a question in the chat. I really oh, like. If, <laughs> oh, get your head out of the gutter. What are you talking about? If we go Drake May, who do we pair up with him? If we don't trust drafting Watkins, yeah, I don't trust Watkins at no. all. I really don't. Um, yeah, I, like I've said, Xavier Leggett's my guy. I love AD Mitchell. Um, but for him, if you're talking about like the guy with the highest ceiling who's probably going to be there, the best value, I think it's Ladd McConkey. Me too. I love Ladd. Yeah. I feel like he's I, – I like Drake a little bit better. Not as much. Actually, I don't want to say I want to like him. I don't want to say I like him better in the underneath game. Mm-hmm. I think he and Daniels have their inconsistencies there. Uh, but, again, I think that Drake attacks the middle of the field a lot more. That's where Lad's probably going to live. Um, so I really like him there. I'm still kind of working on my board trying to figure out who mm-hmm. I like, who I don't. Honestly, I'm going to look it up just to make sure I'm not forgetting anybody. Um, honestly, I'll pull it up for both of us. Let's We'll do a quick little thing, see who yeah. we like for uh, – I mean, I'm huge on I'm huge on Land McConkey. I think the fact like he is such a good um, route runner, and it's not only at the short part of the field, but he can you know beat you intermediate too. And like the way he separates, the Patriots haven't had a real separator uh, in a long time. And yeah. people sort of compare him to like Cooper Cup. Like he's faster yeah. than Cooper Cup, and I know Cup's a little bit more of an outside receiver, I guess. But you know, Lad can play all over the field, and I think that's obviously a positive for any system you're going to plug a guy into. Yeah, and I don't disagree. I think they do definitely need a separator. 
Yeah. I think they've got good enough. And like Kendrick Bourne, he's yeah, not that's really true. Excited. You know, he's a decent separator. Demario is obviously a good separator. So like I feel like they're not like, you know, pining for those guys, not desperate for those guys, but I would like to see someone in, you know, uh, a Patriots uniform. I guess I'm just uh I guess I'm just scarred from like obviously KB getting hurt and Demario being in and out of the lineup and then relying on guys like Devontae Parker all the time who are like negative separators. So that's that's probably yeah, where my head's at. Totally but you want to totally. add it. Yeah, right. And then like Lad, he gives you separation and ability after the catch, which exactly. is what I really like about him. Like, is he an X? No. I think he can be kind of like uh, Jacoby where they used to kind of have him in a reduced yeah. split run fades if they kind of like yeah, match sure. up. You can do that if you want because they win so fast off the line. Then guys immediately have to catch up. And as long as you have good timing, you can make that work. Um, so, yeah, we'll look at this. Uh, mentioned Keon Coleman and Lad. Troy Franklin is not a guy I think fits for them. Again, I just Neither. think he's too small. I don't think that's a good investment. Xavier, like we've talked about it. Yes, absolutely. If he's available in the second, you go get him. Um, Roman Wilson, sure. I don't like him as much as I did after the senior bowl, to be honest with you. I agree. I, I like his toughness in the run game. Really like that. I like his speed. I think he's a better vertical threat than like a Ricky Pearsall or a Ladd McConkey. Um, but also the size kind of scares me. Whereas Lad, he's not big, but I think he's a little better in that regard. Yeah. Um, and then a little bit Rick, thicker than yeah. Roman Wilson. Like Roman Wilson is just like a, a speedy burner, basically, or like a speed guy right. type. Yeah. He's tough, but like he's not, doesn't have the same size. And then Ricky, I think, is bigger and a better contested catcher than a yeah. Lad McConkey. Um, and probably like if you're talking about downfield, if you're trying to get him involved vertically, like he's not going to burn guys, but he could shred people on double moves because he does such a great yeah. job doing those routes. So I like him better there. Um, let's think anybody else. Uh, who do you think would fit with uh, after that category? Who do you? Think um, I like Brendan. I mean, Ryan I like third. Brendan Rice. Uh, yeah. I know Tez Walker is kind of down. Some people are down on him, but he did play with Drake May at UNC for a couple of years. So if you want to pair him with a guy, why not pair him with his old teammate? <laughs> they weren't even together that long either. I think they were ever like eight games or something no, like that. I know. Yeah. Or like five games or like whatever it was. Like it wasn't even that much. And from what I've seen, he just terrified. I think he's – I would take him in like the fifth, man. Yeah. I, I'm not sold. Jermaine Burton off, I think. I don't think the Patriots are going to be interested because of the off-field stuff. Uh, Jalen – so remind me. <laughs> I keep getting my uh, my Jays from Washington. Jalen McMillan is the, is the faster guy. Jalen Polk okay, is yeah. more of the like true X. Right, yeah, no, Jalen. I don't think McMillan's a good fit again. I just think he's not very big, and I don't love yeah. his competitive catchability as a guy who's going to be downfield. Johnny Wilson, I think he's better than people give him credit for. I don't think he's just like an H back. I think he could be a legit big slot option. Mm-hmm. Um, Javon Baker, Javon again, Baker. I think, yeah, I think he's going to sneak into the second probably. Receivers are going to go like hotcakes in this. Like they're just going to go. So yeah, he's also like. I don't know if he can be – like, if, with the second pick, I like it. Actually, no, a lot of these guys are probably going to be better number twos anyway. Um, and if you're going to talk about that, I think he gives you most explosive ability. I need to watch him. He was my next guy I was going to watch after Keon Coleman, so I can give a better take on him. But from what I've heard, um, from, like, some of the plays that I've already seen, um, he really intrigues me. And then the rest is kind of, you know. Yeah, really the rest. Of stud. Um, he's also undersized, though. Kind of feels redundant with Pop. I was going to say Malik Washington was a guy who shined at the Shrine Bowl this year. Um, he played really well, but you're right. He's undersized and he, he's very redundant to your room with a guy like Pop. But um, elsewhere, I, I think that's a guy who's going to sneaky uh, land somewhere and impress in the NFL because Malik Washington's a pretty good player. Yeah, but yeah, I think the rest. Anthony Gold. Now, I know my man Dame Parsons of the Draft Network is high on him. I was looking at uh, the stats for receivers in the draft class against man coverage. Yards per route run. First, Xavier Leggett. Second, Anthony Gold. Interesting. Now, he's an okay. undersized guy, but in all the mocks, I keep seeing him going like the sixth round. Dude, mm. if I can get a guy, I don't care what size he is. If you can beat man coverage, he's fast too. Like yeah. he's a yak threat. He's he's just not big. If he were like six one, we'd be talking about him probably in the second round. So uh yeah, I, I really like him as maybe a late round guy. But yeah, for the Drake May fits. I don't think you need a certain type for him because, again, he can attack the middle. He can attack outside. I just think you need somebody who can either win on crossers or win on goes. Um, and I, you know, we've already kind of gone over that. I think that right. the better candidates for that are like Ladd, Ricky Pearsall, Keon Coleman, um, and then Xavier Leggett is a stud. Yeah. All right. Let's go on to the next question. Get a couple more in here before we bounce. Uh, let's see. Somebody's actually redundant. Um, oh, here's a good one. All right. 
Uh, ooh, let me get that down there too. All right, why are people suddenly so low on Drake May? In my opinion, he's the number one pick in any other class, including next year's less than promising group. He has all the tools. He just needs refinement. You can kick this one off. Let's yeah, I. It's it's <laughs> um crazy is the the nicest way to say it. I think it's uh just exhaustion in the draft process. Sometimes people yeah. overthink it. The draft should be in February, like not actually, but you know, just the the process and the the watching the tape and then watching the tape again and then you know thinking over it and rethinking it and you know who should I go with this guy or well Jaden Daniels can run and well Caleb Williams is this and then it's like all of a sudden you forget that Drake May is just a really good quarterback. Like I think it's that simple, um, and I think it'd be a home run if the Patriots can land him at number three. So I don't think it's anything necessarily that he's done on the field, off the field in interviews. Uh, I just think that it's draft exhaustion and, you know, it, it gets it gets redundant and your head kind of goes. And I think people start to overthink things when they don't really have to because Drake May is really good. Yeah, I mean, you nailed it. I just think also, like, people are probably lying. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Really, what incentive is there to be honest with someone who you know is going to report on something if it's a player that you don't want to go off the board first? So right. there's some of that. But then you have, like, Chris Sims who – you know, I like I respect that people have differing opinions. Like mm -hmm. I'm fine with Evan Lazar right now, whose opinion I respect very highly about Keon Coleman. We see him completely differently. That's part of the evaluation process. Right. Like the goal is not to get these things right, it's to give it an honest shot, learn from your mistakes, and try to, you know, improve in the future. No one's trying to, you know, you like to get it right, that's awesome. But yeah, the right. goal shouldn't be to be correct necessarily. Just give it your best shot. Mm -hmm. Um, so while I understand, I totally understand why people are talking themselves into Daniels over May. I get that. Because yeah. you look at the tape, like Daniels doesn't make as many like glaring mistakes where you're like, oh my God. It's more like, you know, the physical things where the size kind of scares you. And then the age kind of scares you. And the arm strength he doesn't have as well, much as Drake may. But Drake has a lot more stuff on his tape where it's like, dude, you got to get this cleaned up. Or yeah. like we're talking bust potential. I don't think Jaden Daniels has really bust potential. It's more like, is he going to be on the field? And how is he going to maybe play in like adverse weather? where he needs to drive throws from the opposite hash, you know, 30 yards downfield. And he might, if he has to do it like off platform, it might be an issue. So I understand, you know, having them rank differently. Um, I don't agree. I think that Drake, like Caleb's in his own tier. I think Drake is in his own tier. And I think Jaden is like under that, mm -hmm. but I think they are like in a realm of their own. But if you want to start talking about like JJ McCarthy, Bo Nix, Michael Penix, like no, this thanks. Man, that's yeah, crazy. I agree. We're on the Respectfully, side. you're nuts. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Speaking of Michael Penix Jr., we're going to close out. Uh, you guys, throw questions in the chat if you want. I'll try to get to them. Oh, we have a donation. Let's see where that is. Oh, let's see. I'm trying to find it. This is so – it's really hard to be the producer and um, the guy who's doing the questions. I'm sorry. All right, here we go. I believe if Daniels has gone first, thank you so much, Drew. Uh, I believe if Daniels has gone at three, we need to trade down with the Vikings, get two first round picks, and the first next year, get a tackle and Penix 34, get a wide receiver. So let's have the Penix conversation. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of already touched on the possibility of a trade deck with the Vikings. Very unlikely, according to Albert Breer. Never say never. Still the NFL, you know, stuff right. happens. Um, but this was going to be the next question anyway, so this is perfect. Uh, yeah, we'll how tie it in. Hmm? I said, yeah, we'll tie it into that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I get two first round picks the first next year. Yeah. I mean, if, if the only reason that the Patriots would ever pull this trade off is if for some reason they were off Drake May and or Jaden Daniels. And they were like, you know what? Because this this trade is going to happen before the draft. Right. So it's it's got to be like they are unsure about at least one of them. And they say they exactly. don't really want it, or it's both. And they're like, all right, like, let's build around it. The argument that you don't take a quarterback because you don't have a good supporting cast is asinine. I agree. Like, I agree. if you want to protect your quarterback that bad, run the ball, run the ball every play. I don't care. But like, don't pass up on a potential franchise quarterback, potential top 12 quarterback, just because you don't have a good supporting cast. That's to me is complete lunacy. You know, you just need to prioritize it moving forward. Um, but yeah, so I like the idea. If you do pick in the first round with the 11th pick, I agree. Unless you can get like a Romo Dunze or somebody like those top tier guys who are going to go on the field and dominate. Yeah. Um, I would rather take like an Olu or Joel is probably not going to be there. Or um, even if you want to trade back a little bit, get someone like uh, who's a good left tackle that's uh, going to be there a little later, like a Troy Tatanu, um, uh, Amarius Mims, J.C. Yeah. Latham, guys like that who have some versatility can play either place. And then in terms of Penix, I like him. I know they haven't like interviewed him and they haven't been tied to him, but they also have Tyler Hughes on staff who worked with him yeah. and knows him very, very well. So I don't think – like top 30 visits will probably tell us more than anything else. Um, 
because, you know, they can meet with people at these certain places, but the top 30, they have limited amount of visits. So right. that's where you really see where they're prioritizing. And historically, it's been a pretty good indicator of where they might pick. Um, but I like Penix. Like one, his so pressure to stack ratio, it's like 7%, which is crazy. Below 10% is outstanding. He does have his issues. I think like when his mechanics get sloppy, his his accuracy is all over the place. And it's not like Drake where I'm not sure how fixable it is because he just already has such wonky mechanics. Like I, I'm not a quarterback expert. I don't know if they're fixable, uh, but I love him as a human being. He's got ice in his veins. We've seen that in so many yeah. big games where he goes for the throat on um, like end of game drives to put things away. Um, and he's a winner. Um, so there's a lot to like about him and apparently his medicals came back good and teams are happy with that. So if the Patriots did want to punt on a quarterback with their top pick, then yeah, Penix is probably the guy that I would want them to get more than anybody else in that tier. I agree. I think he's, uh, the way that the draft boards have come through, not really come through, but you know, looking into it more like JJ McCarthy might've, you know, gone a little bit higher for me than Penix at this point, but I have him higher than Bo Nix. Like I think that Penix is a really good player. I think the real question mark was the injury history with the two torn ACLs in college, but his medicals checked out. And you mentioned the top 30 visits and you mentioned them not meeting with him yet. A lot of times guys, you know, teams like to keep things like that under the radar. And sometimes mm -hmm. if they have enough info from Tyler Hughes, and if they like the, num uh, if they like the medicals and they just like his tape, they might say, we don't need to let anybody know that we like this guy because then guys will jump them at 34, whatever. So, yeah, they could take Penix at 34 and be just fine, and that could be their plan all along. So um, I would be happy with it. I agree. I like uh, – he's he's a clutch player. He – you know, he's nails at times. Like, there, there were a couple throws down the stretch in uh, the Pac-12 championship game and then the uh, the semifinal where it's just like third and whatever. They need a play, and Penix makes it every single time. So yeah. that's the intangible stuff you need in a quarterback. Um Jason in the chat says Penix is a bit of a mess under pressure. Yes, but so long as you know you you keep things upright around him, then he's going to be just fine. Don't make it a it's mess. Brady. It's I mean, not, he's obviously not Brady, but like, yeah, some quarterbacks just aren't good under pressure. Get a good right. offensive line. That's yeah. <laughs> so um, I'd be okay with them taking a shot at Penix at thirty-four. Yes, sir. All right, we're going to wrap it up. This was a lot of fun. Let me get that off the board. I don't know what. There we go. Okay, there's a pretty banner. All right, but Mike, this was a blast, buddy. Uh, we've got to do this again soon, but for now, please tell the people where they can find you if they don't already know, yeah. and let them know what great stuff you got coming down the pipeline. All right, at Mike Cadlick on Twitter, you can uh, look out for all our patch coverage there from WEI. You can look out for all my SpongeBob memes uh, and all that good stuff. Six Rings podcast uh, with Andy Hart and Fitzy uh, over at WEI, and for Odyssey, you can uh, follow us on Twitter there at Six Rings Pod. We have a ton of stuff coming out. We have prospect pods. Uh, Wednesday live shows, uh, free agency previews, all that good stuff over on the Six Rings podcast. So go check that out and subscribe if you can. We'd appreciate it. And uh, yeah, wei.com with Patriots coverage every single day uh, from myself. So uh, we're all there. Are you seeing some breaking news or? Mike Williams is officially a Jet. Uh, I, don't, I don't care. I don't yeah, care. Yeah, <laughs> Mike Williams is a Jet. Okay. Well, that's where you can find my stuff. And Taylor, thank you for having me. And uh, we will uh, definitely do this soon. So I uh, appreciate it. Thank you for being an ad, bud. All right. Oh, I'll close out with this. Um, is JJ going before Mayor Daniels? Yeah. Not a snowball's chance in hell. All <laughs> right. <laughs> we'll see y'all later. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. And we will see.